in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I am your host, Russell Guest, and joining me today are my two good friends and co-hosts, Brian Fry from Spokane, Washington, and Nathan Lutz from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. How are you both doing? And it's a race to who answers first. I'm going to answer first. I got it. I'm good. Yeah. I think I snuck it in there. Good afternoon, all. Before we get going, let's just ask people, what is your go-to black and white movie? Brian, why don't you take this one first? Probably Maltese Falcon. Well, we'd covered that one, so you're in good shape for that one. That's a great choice, and it's a classic. Nathan, what about you? What's your go-to black and white movie? Hey, I discovered this relatively recently, and it's so amazing that this exists and you can actually just go to wikipedia and watch this movie the original jurassic world is something of an incredible thing to exist it's it's live action with stop motion effects they go to an an island they discover dinosaurs there they have hijinks with dinosaurs it's amazing you may need to introduce us to that at some point because i'm intrigued it's also a silent film completely, so uh, it'd be a little bit of a, uh, a, a, a different thing to, uh, to go down. But uh, we've, we've done it once before. We did a Chaplin movie. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to go, and I like my Christmas movies a lot. Uh, not so much the Hallmark ones that are disposable and like a dime a dozen, but like, I like the good Christmas movies. And one of my favorites is It's a Wonderful Life from 1946. Because of the holiday nature of it, I return to it more frequently than a lot of other movies. So uh, that's my go-to black and white. So, Gotcha. Nathan, what's the last movie you saw? I'm going to give you two things here. First, I just watched, not a movie, but episode three of the Loki show, which is a lot of fun and continues to be something I'm excited about. But I'm going to tell you about the next movie that I'm going to watch because... I'm excited to check out something that I was kind of waiting for it to be on sale at some point, but the 4K extended Lord of the Rings cuts that have come out, and I'm very much looking to experiencing those movies all over again with that. I'm not buying them again. I'm not doing it. I am not doing it. I will not buy those movies again. I've never bought a copy myself, so... Oh, I've got the dvd i got the dang extended editions dvd then i bought the extended blu-rays i'm not buying it oh, again no oh no not doing it well refuse peter jackson wants your money brian yeah <sighs> peter jackson has my money <laughs> all my money don't you want to buy the hobbit movies too i i am personally sustaining the country of new zealand <laughs> <laughs> brian what about you what's the last movie you saw uh, the last movie I saw was Underwater with Kristen Stewart. And I don't know what you've heard or if you've heard, but it was actually a pretty enjoyable movie. I had a good time with it. Some people are really hard on her, but maybe it's just me. But like I, Twilight stuff aside, I actually like Kristen Stewart. I think she gets an unfair bad rap. I've been saying the same thing about Rob Pattinson. So I, I completely agree with you. I think you just need to cut and paste that out of their career uh, as a as a film enthusiast. And take them for what they're actually capable of. Well, they made all the money they ever have to in their life in four films, and then they get to do other things after that. So it gives them the freedom as actors. So I'm not going to hold it against them. You know. Yeah. The last movie I saw was Rocket Man from 2019. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a uh, an interesting artistic piece. It's not quite as out there as like Across the Universe, the Beatles musical movie, but it's also not exactly a straight up biopic. It's a marriage between the two things. So it has artistic representations. Uh, it's it's bending exactly what happened in some cases for entertainment's sake. I'm a big Elton John fan, so I I had a good time with it. So yeah, excellent. Now, 
We're gonna get in our time machines and go back a little farther than we usually do, which excites me because I like to mix it up and do everything. Brian, what are we gonna do today? We are gonna do Laura. Laura from 1944. It stars Jean Tierney, Dana Andrews, Clifton Webb, Vincent Price, and Judith Anderson. The budget was $1.2 million. It grosses $2 million. And because it's so old, I don't have good metrics worth where it stood in the box office that year. But I can tell you the number one movie that year was Going My Way, starring Bing Crosby. Before Lenny Kravitz asked, are you going to go my way? Bing Crosby asked it. He's a hometown hero up here in Spokane. Yep, we literally have a theater named after him. I did not know that. IMDb gives Laura an 8.0. The critics of Rotten Tomatoes give this a very, very fresh rating. 100% fresh. And the audience score is also very high at 91%. So this is an Academy Award winner for Best Black and White Cinematography. It is nominated for four more uh, Academy Awards, including Best Supporting Actor for Clifton Webb, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Black and White Art Direction. And AFI gives it its honor of being on the 100 Years of Thrills list at number 73. And uh, Nathan will probably have a lot more to add to this, but it was also ranked in AFI's number 100 years of film scores it was number seven on the film scores list really yeah uh, and if i t- uh, gives it a nice honor again then they did the top 10 mystery films this is their number four mystery of all time so this movie is definitely lauded it's definitely appreciated and if you talk to people now you might not hear a lot of name recognition from it but that's why we dug it up and we wanted to investigate it here i'm gonna start with you nathan Had you seen Laura before? Had you even heard of it? And what were you expecting coming in? I am coming into this completely fresh. This is an era of movies that I have not a great deal of experience with. I feel like I'm a little bit more familiar with scores of this era because I'm a fan of certain composers who are writing during this age of Hollywood that uh, their music is stuff that I love and, you know, bleeds into their work for ordinary orchestral writing and whatnot. But I have never seen this movie or even heard of it. So first blush, how did it go down? This definitely feels incredibly well crafted this is very much every little piece especially when you rewatch this movie every little piece of it feels very much like part of this big mystery web and especially the second time around you realize okay this is a clue for this and this is a clue for this and this is something that if you're really paying attention it rewards you very well for so yeah very impressive movie Okay, Brian, how about you? You're, you're a little more versed in the noir genre. And as you mentioned, the Maltese Falcon being one of your go-to black and white movies. Now, how did you take, Laura? Was this your first time on this one? Yeah, it was my first time on this one, too. So I was pretty excited about it. Uh, unfortunately, my first viewing of it, I had just gotten home from work and I was tired and cranky. And, and I had a really tough time. Like By the end of the movie, I was into it, but it was a rough start for me subsequently watched it several times and it is a fantastic watch. I, I wish I had uh, been arrested and not tried to, you know, cram it into the, the cranny that I tried to cram it in that first time, just because I, I got some stuff in my head where I was like, ah, this isn't that good. And then I was really wrong about it. Yeah. I, I was just going through movies with Mary and, uh, when we were in college and we were just doing the AFI thrills list, like, you know, the, the, the horror movies list, the comedies list. And like, we were, we were just at the rental store. This was just one of those ones that I, I happened across and it was on the list and we, we got it. And with nothing more than that to go to bat for it, we went in and I loved it. I talked to my grandmother uh, about it afterwards. She's like, Oh yeah, that's a really good movie. And I was just like, why doesn't anybody ever talk about it now? And it's just kind of one of those things where it's just like, I'm not sure. Like, it just seems to have been too far enough back where maybe it's just been forgotten about. But uh, when you certain movies endure, like Gone with the Wind will always be talked about. Casablanca will always be talked about. But there's this is one of those movies that I don't want people to forget. So when, when it came up time for the, to pick this one, this was a dealer's choice. And I, I did go to bat for this one. And so uh, I was really happy to come back to it again because a lot of the nuances, to Nathan's point... There's a rich dynamic between the characters that still gives you rewatch value beyond the who done it aspect of it. Like so it's deeper than just a who done it, if that's fair to say. No, oh, more than fair. From here on out, we're gonna spoil Laura. And by the way, this is a movie you don't want spoiled. So if you haven't seen this movie, 
you may want to pause and go watch the movie and come back. Otherwise, we will plow ahead after this advertisement break. Welcome to the Flashback Flicks Retro Movie Podcast. I'm Ricky. I'm Grayson. And every week we review a movie from the past and reflect on things we miss, things we loved, and things we want to see again. Yeah, because we believe any movie worth watching is worth watching again. So if you like films, friendship, and a lot of callbacks, I mean, just so many callbacks, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever RSS feeds go for like-minded, movie-loving individuals like you what happens when two modern film fans go back and rewatch all the old classic films from yesteryear to see if they hold up you get the classic film jerks podcast find the classic film jerks podcast on all the major platforms all right we're back and this is your final warning if you haven't seen laura since 1944 we're gonna spoil it again nathan will you refresh people's memory Mark McPherson, infamous detective and proof that millennials, being annoying with pulling out our phones all the time, is really nothing new, investigates the murder of Laura Hunt. The suspects? Waldo Lidecker, notorious reporter and Laura's controlling mentor and patron. Shelby Carpenter, playboy in debt to Laura's aunt and engaged to marry Laura. Laura's aunt, infatuated lender to Shelby and jealous of Laura. Bessie Clary, Laura's loyal housekeeper, desperate to maintain Laura's image. Between them, McPherson uncovers a web of deceit masked by their high society. In flashbacks, we witness Lidecker's vicious investigations of anyone who might get close to Laura. We discover Carpenter's affair with a model, Diane Redford, who can't be found. McPherson finds that even Bessie has disturbed the crime scene to hide Laura's apparent drinking. Through it all, the detective becomes enamored of the murder victim, discovering through each story her boldness and her charm. After a night searching for clues in her apartment, McPherson falls asleep under her portrait and wakes to find the real Laura returning to the apartment. Clues fall into place. The victim was found in Laura's clothing, but the shotgun blast made her unrecognizable. McPherson and Laura realize that the victim is really Diane Redford, who must have been in Laura's apartment with her lover, Shelby Carpenter. Now it seems that Laura is the prime suspect, but McPherson does not believe it. On a hunch, he investigates a clock that Waldo Lidecker gave to Laura and discovers inside a shotgun with both barrels fired, the murder weapon. The detective goes to find Lidecker, but realizes that the journalist has snuck back into the apartment, his jealousy of Laura having driven him to murder. Returning inside at the last second, McPherson exchanges gunfire with Lidecker. Lidecker hits the clock. McPherson makes the kill. This is a movie that builds and builds and uh, has a a couple of nice twists and turns in it. Brian, this is not a typical whodunit kind of movie there's a lot more turns to it there's more complexity to it there's more layers and doors that keep opening up and how this movie is a little different than just a simple straightforward mystery i think that to a certain degree a lot of these whodunit crime movies sometimes get lost a little bit in the uh the twist or the attempted twist or having more than one twist it's kind of the same uh Kind of the same idea where, I don't know if we have any Rick and Morty watchers, but it's Rick's issue with heist movies. I do find this one to be fairly straightforward in the process. Uh, I would have liked to have seen maybe a little bit more from the detective's uh, standpoint in terms of his mental process. Like whether it's a voiceover, you know, what he's thinking, that sort of thing. But you could also say that that void of of stream of consciousness or knowing what's going on adds to the suspense. So, you know, you can you can have it either way. I really do enjoy how this movie keeps you guessing without intentionally making you guess like, oh, it's definitely them then. You know, there's none of those points to me. It's always just a constant. Wow, I really don't know who did it. Yeah, I don't feel like they try and trick you too much either. They just... Correct. Yeah, I don't feel like it's gimmicky. I feel like... And it's always interesting. Nathan, what about you? What was this ride like for you? Hey, I'm going to bring back my eternal call back to The Expanse, where uh, that is a modern sci-fi series that starts out with a noir story about a a detective who falls in love with the object of his search who's been he's been assigned to find this girl and it's so funny to me watching through this movie where 
it's a lot of similar notes where there's a detective who maybe he's great, maybe he just used to be great, but he gets through the case not necessarily because he's the most brilliant, not because he's the most well-liked or known, but because he's obsessed, because he's deeply invested in this victim. And so I think you guys have been saying this isn't a movie where it feels like everyone's being too clever or tricky. Rather, this is something where just because he's there at the right times, because he hangs around, he, as a result, gets to find all the clues and puts all the clues together with us. I appreciate that. One of the things I found really interesting about this film is very infrequently in crime noir do you see every suspect basically you know, jumping over one another to be around the detective. Like that, that in, in itself was kind of a suspicious thing for me. So every character is like, don't you want me to hang around? Don't you want to ask me some questions? So there's an overarching idea of attention seeking from, from really everyone involved. Yeah. So there's, there's that piece. And then you have, you know, the detective playing everything so close to his chest. Like I said, you don't really have an idea of his mental... Uh, thought process going through most of this uh, until you really get the idea that he's getting invested in this woman the same way the other two primary suspects are. But I mean, even the housekeeper is, you know, wants to be there, wants to protect her. Like there's just so much injecting of oneself into this plot that I felt like that was the main process of making you think truly anyone could have done it because everybody's up in this guy's business trying to figure out what he knows. No, that's a very good point. There's a lot of erratic behavior. People are caught lying. Even in the very, very beginning, you see people like Shelby, like saying like, oh, I went to the theater and like he asked him what he listened to and he lied. And like, these are simple little lies from the very first point. So everybody's fishy. People like the Bessie took bottles and moved them and and she's very confrontational with the detective. And, you know, Waldo is probably one of the less suspicious ones at first. But, I mean, he's he's definitely out for something. He's a, he's a very powerful man, very influential. And when he goes leading you, you do have to also question him. So, to your old point, you are kind of questioning everybody. And also, I like Nathan's point about uh, what you said about The Expanse. I see some parallels with this. McPherson doesn't actually seem like the brightest detective. We don't get the gist that he's brilliant, but he becomes very invested in it because of this magnetic person, Laura. And he starts to fall for the idea of her. But what a turn it was for me the first time I was watching it to see that she was still alive at the halfway point in the movie. And that really shook things up. I would even say the biggest bombshell is that the victim isn't even dead. And midway through the movie. Yeah, it's really interesting how it almost becomes this big switch where at the beginning, all of the different suspects are trying to sort of accuse each other. They're all sh throwing shade at one another. And then immediately afterwards, about half of them start almost trying to be accused themselves because they start thinking, oh my gosh, it must have been Laura. And I can't let Laura get accused of this. So all of a sudden this person everyone is trying to defend her and they think that the detective is after her so the whole dynamic changes after that moment it's really effective that three-quarter part of the story too also has a nice little turn that we didn't really mention of if laura comes back who's the corpse that got shotgun blasted in the face that is unidentifiable because this model diane redburn was enough like laura and which they established earlier that uh, she could be mistaken as such without somebody close enough to identify the body. And uh, that's a pretty good turn, too, of like, well, Flora's here. Somebody definitely got murdered. Who is it? How did they do this? And how did that happen? So, like, there's this whole, like, again, so the halfway point, Laura comes back. Then, the like, the 50% to 75% mark turns into who did get killed and who did that. And then the last, I don't even know, 10% is a very, very exciting, like, the action. It's actually thrilling at that point. So... This movie goes through a lot of turns. I think that uh, one part, too, uh, this is just something amusing. So I remember I told you that uh, the, my first watch wasn't all that successful. I actually thought the detective was dreaming 
when she came in. Like, I didn't realize that they were introducing her as a, a character who's very much alive. It was possible. I would have believed that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I went into the first chunk of her being actually alive, thinking that he was drunk and asleep, and he's having this dream about her still being alive, and that she was going to in turn like they were going to use that as a as a a plot driver where his subconscious his drunk asleep subconscious fills in some piece as her as a ghost in his head like that's where I was going with it at the time I know the first time I watched it which I was not tired I was completely invested I was pausing and I had I was reserving myself and I was asking myself. I know he just went to sleep. The camera effect was zoomed in and then zoomed back out. Very tastefully done. That's a nice time lapse uh, at this point in time. It's way better than the wavy screen effect. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I myself was asking, could this be real? Like, the fact that you were asking yourself that, Brian, I think is actually a nice moment of, like, letting the audience find their feet. Otto Preminger isn't um, spelling it out for you necessarily. Like, you find your feet quickly. Like, you know that she's back by when other people start to come in and react and stuff like that. But uh, it that's another turn. Like, that's a smaller turn. But, like, this movie has so many more tricks than just one trick up its sleeve. And that's that's another good example of that. I was talking to Chad, who's not on this podcast with us. He said this movie felt like a play. Now, that oftentimes feels like I feel like a lot of times these earlier films uh, naturally are evolving where playwrights and stuff like that are evolving into movies and silent films are evolving into movies. Do you feel like that when this is made, Nathan impacted how this movie felt? And do you feel like it would have been made differently had this been made much, much later? One thing that is very immediate to notice in this movie is that it's extremely efficient with its use of scenery there's maybe five or six locations total for this entire movie there's laura's apartment there's uh laura's aunt's place there's the outside of laura's apartment and there's the little basement essentially that is the police department there's the vacation house and sort of a party awning sort of thing that goes on and i guess there's like a lunch table and that's pretty much it i i I mean i guess there are one or two other locations but again this is extremely efficient there aren't that many i'm just going to call them sets to put up the camera doesn't do anything terribly complicated within those sets for the most part there aren't a lot of complicated shots being set up, so there there aren't really tricks often with mirrors or anything. So in a way, I can totally understand that, you know, this is not a movie that is trying to show off the directorial or, you know, talent or put the viewer into the scene as another individual. Interesting. I'm going to come back to that in the director's segment, but uh, yeah, Brian... Uh, Vera Caspi first wrote her story, uh, Ring Twice for Laura, in 1939, and it was adapted into a novel called Laura, and the novel was then serialized into a magazine in 1942 under the title Ring Twice for Laura. That novel then falls into five sections and five separate voices, and the story is actually told through all five principal characters, and it becomes cumbersome in the structure of a 1940s movie to be able to cover this. Do you feel like they've adapted the source material to the movie in a way that's fitting? Or would you like to see it narrated and told through five perspectives? No. Uh, short, to the most recent question, that's a, that's a no. It doesn't need to be told from, from five different perspectives. I think this was, a, this was an appropriate telling. I'm not familiar with the source material, so I can't you know, say that something powerful couldn't have come from that so i'll admit to that you know straight out but you know it's i'm always a fan of of reading what you watch and watching what you read so you know anything's possible i will say the recent netflix series i say recent this is probably three years ago now of haunting of hill house Mm -hmm. which was told very much in the sense and and it was very much a bunch of mysteries where Each episode was told from a different viewpoint character, and that was so unbelievably effective that I could totally see this movie being told that way and it being fascinating where 
you know, you build up through the first half of this series where you start with McPherson, maybe, then you go to Lut, or you, you know, go character to character until you finally get to one viewpoint that makes it obvious that Lore is alive, and then finally at the end you maybe get to Lidecker or something as the uh, as as the viewpoint narrator as you find out the final bits of the clues. So, yeah, I could totally see it this way. Lidecker is such a great character. Like. I he just he's <laughs> he's also magnetic and like what won't he say and such a large personality I I he he chewed up every bit of screen time that he had I I truly enjoyed watching him he he was very amusing to watch agreed let's go into the cast here a little bit Brian are there any casting notes that you wanted to share uh, specifically that I enjoyed the the cast that they chose for this I think that each character. Um, with the exception of maybe the uh, um, the detective uh, Dana Andrews, uh, like with the exception of him, and and I could even see some people saying him too. All of these people are fairly irritating in one way or the other. I don't know if you guys kind of got that too. Is that like what you were talking about, uh, Nathan? Where like they're all kind of jittery and acting irregularly in terms of how their relationship to the detective is, or I guess it was Brian who made that point. But uh... it's I I get the sense from all of them that they're all really self-absorbed. And yeah. this is one of these books that is about a bunch of high society people who are all just totally self-absorbed in their relationships to everybody and are all conniving about things. So I'm not sure that it's so much an act that they're putting on for the detective so much as the detective is kind of intruding on their personal or, you know, group social scene. And they are, as a group, rebuffing him as much as they are each other. So mm, it's, the point. you know, I, I, I totally understand what I think the movie is going for with them. And it really didn't bug me. I, I wouldn't call it annoying so much as they're just very strong personalities and their faults are writ large. I like what you pointed out there. And in much in terms of how you said how efficient this movie was with its physical environments, they're really efficient with their character sets. This isn't a deep cast. This isn't a long list of actors. And what they've done is given each one of them enough screen time where they're a suspicious, but b interesting and c they act on other people. So they're, they're pushing and pulling each other and they're, they're sending off forces that cause each other to react to each other in a really interesting way as opposed to a one at a time when the detective is the one shaking the trees. These guys are taking shots at each other. They're pushing people in front of the buses, metaphorically, if you will. It's really interesting to see, like you said, Nathan, these aren't necessarily the a typical batch of people. They are all very self-absorbed and they're out for themselves and what they want. And they all want Laura. Well, except Laura's aunt, who wants Shelby. Honestly, I could have gone for even more than just, uh, you know, Vincent Price being punched in the gut and Clifton getting shot. Like, they I, they both annoyed the crap out of me. Like, like Interesting. E- even on multiple watches, I was like, this guy's smooth BS versus Lidecker's crass, you know, sharp stick. Like, they both went about it two different ways. One guy made your brain numb and the other guy made you, you know, pissed off. Want to take a shower? Like he's slow sliding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So oh, I don't gosh. know. It was just both of them were were fairly deplorable people, in my opinion. I, you get you know the the detective, and it's almost like he doesn't like he knows he has to be a part of it in the sense that he's trying to figure out who murdered who. But every time he pulls that game out and everything, he's just like, oh god, I hate you people. I gotta focus on something else. Well, the original choice of the role of Laura was Jennifer Jones, who turned it down. Rosalind Russell was offered the role, but it felt too small, and she turned it down. Jean Tierney originally did not want to make this movie, but it, but anyway, uh, she was under contract obligations, which is an interesting thing that you don't have so much today. But back then, studios had you under contract, and they had a lot of ability to tell you what to be in. Jean Tierney didn't give herself too much credit for the movie's success. It never felt like her own performance in a way that was more than adequate to her. She is a pretty, I should say, not necessarily accomplished actor, but she was very big in her time. And this was a big movie for her ascent. But she was still pleased that the audience liked it. She's a humble type personality to say that. Um, Jean Tierney, I mean, she comes in halfway through this movie, but she sure leaves a lasting impression. Is that a fair thing? 
Um, I think that that she, through the obsessions of the other characters, was very present throughout the film. And I think it's difficult, maybe, in a way, to say that, you know, these characters have built this character up only for it to turn into she has to live up to what they've built her up to be. So this detective is saying, all right, two men in love with the same woman. She was very magnetic. He's hearing stories about her. You know, he is getting infatuated before he ever meets her based on everyone else's opinion of her. And then you have to have an actress come in and actually live up to that. And I thought that was one of the things that she did remarkably well was coming in halfway through the movie where everyone's built her up to be this desirable person, including the person who's never met her. And then you actually have to have her act her way into making her desirable in the in the audience's head. And there's a fair bit of mystery within herself and how she's portraying it, too. We don't really know where she stands in things. And so the very character of Laura herself is another mystery within this bigger mystery. I will say she doesn't in narrative current timeline. She comes in through halfway through the movie. But I think it is a big help for her character and for the audience to sort of get her in to everyone's minds that she actually is on screen for a lot of those earlier parts of the movie in flashbacks. You are right about that. That's a good point. Now, sometimes when we do an older movie, it's interesting. The whole person's life has played out and uh, Jean Tierney is no longer alive. And uh, it was interesting to be able to see where this was in, in her life. I mean, looking up her bio, she does have a lot of very major tragedies in her life. And so she's she grows up with a super strict dad. She's super obedient and like dedicated to him. He sends her to Paris. But when she comes back, his, like he has a major lawsuit and major financial trouble. The family loses their home and they move. And on their way to their move, they stop in Hollywood. And Jean was noticed at age 17 as just being a very beautiful woman. And they brought her in and they thought that she could be in movies. Her father said, no way, you need to just marry a guy. And so she compromised and she got onto Broadway. Well, when she went to, on Broadway, the president of 20th Century Fox uh, saw her in a, in a stage performance called The Male Animal. He had to have her. And at, at this point, the family's financial trouble was so bad that uh, the dad was a little more allowing her to come on. So he totally, sadly exploits her and then she falls in love with a, a fashion designer named Ole Cassini. Now her father disapproved of this. If you haven't noticed, her father's kind of a jerk. And um, he threatened to have her mentally committed to a, a hospital if she married him. And so she did it anyway, uh, even against the studio's wishes, against her father's wishes. And when he found out in uh, rebellion, her dad had been managing her money and she was breaking away from him. She found out all the money that she had ever made was taken by her father as well and spent and so she vowed never to speak to him again it unfortunately gets one step worse she and oleg got pregnant and she unknowingly had german measles when she came into contact with doing troop morale uh you know just to like making like sites like to say like hi i'm a famous person time, yeah. yeah like yeah like uh, supporting the war captain america ing yeah exactly so she was supporting the war and unfortunately she came into somebody who had german measles and that led uh, to her daughter being blind, deaf, and mentally challenged. So she was devastated that uh, her child was not um, fully functioning. And she was dealing with the money trouble. Oleg uh, and her, their relationship later struggles. This is a major strain on them. And it's ironic that Oleg was saying that in Tierney's performance here in Laura, that's the point at which point this movie happens in her life. He said, it's ironic that much of the film, she played this girl who was presumably dead, who was actually alive. But he said Jean was in quite the opposite. After Daria's birth, she seemed to just die inside. There was a ghostly quality of evidence to both Laura and Jean. And even after Jean was found to be alive in the movie, she had a certain mystery and aura that permeates through the film. And it gives her much of the magic, but there's a pain there and there's a distance. And she never was quite able to bridge that together again and this is a major stepping stone for Jean because she goes on to get an Oscar nomination for the next movie and leave it leave her to heaven which that's another impressive performance as well so and then sadly Jean has mental problems later in life and she unfortunately has to stop acting sooner so yeah it's she's a super interesting person she even had a relationship with JFK but he was a Catholic and when you're a politician and you're Catholic you have to have all these things and she was a divorced woman and that didn't happen. So she's such an interesting person uh, through all the ups and downs of her of her career. But uh, it's it is interesting. This this is at the heels of a very major 
major part of like her life and it's all coming down on her at this point. So pretty interesting. Yeah. I didn't know any of that. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's Britney, Britney Spears dead level. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Billy Joel's brother-in-law manager (laughs) bad for sure. Now, this is Vincent Price's favorite movie that he had done. Now, Vincent Price is largely known as kind of your fun horror movie kind of thing. Nathan, what do you think about Vincent Price here? So Vincent Price plays one of, uh, as we've discussed, several very large characters in the way that they act. And his direction is this very laissez-faire guy who allows himself to get pulled in a lot of directions and like Laura, everyone seems to be in love with him and he finds himself inadvertently at the center of a lot of things. And that it, that forms, you know, half of the web of this movie. And it is really interesting to see an actor pull off something where you totally believe that this guy is likable and liked by a bunch of people and that he's accidentally, found himself the beneficiary of a rich person giving him a lot of money that he in no way really deserves to have and yet finds himself in these crazy situations i think it's a really successful character it's such a surprise from what you later go on to know from vincent price later like he's this he doesn't even quite talk the same like he doesn't have this iconic mustache and he's in these kind of campy horror movies that are like chillers and this does sit you sit there and you go like this guy's a better actor than i had initially thought so it's interesting the the turn that his career goes on to have brian any other big thoughts that you had on this one maybe clifton webb who got nominated for an oscar on this one uh no not really on the cast i will say that both uh both the male leads apart from dan andrews uh character Like they do, I would already touched on how they've, they kind of make you dislike them both. They're both very oily in their own different ways. You have one who's very affable. You have one who's very prickly. So it's, it's an interesting dichotomy that adds another layer to the movie beyond the, the detectives kind of more calming, more steady persona. Yeah. So Clifton Webb, had a deal with the shock of seeing himself on screen after long absence from Hollywood. He had a a strange effect on him psychologically. He said for the first time he realized that he was no longer a dashing young actor. Seeing him on the screen at this point transformed him in a way. And he actually would go on to have a very successful run as a, as an older actor, more successful than he was after having been away from film this long. So it's an interesting situation where this reignited Clifton Webb's career too. So this was a big boost for everybody, including the director, Otto Preminger. Uh, But before I move on, I just want to call it out there. There's a Screen Guild Theater broadcast. If you like radio broadcasts, this is a a 30-minute radio adaptation of this where all of the main cast, Gene Tierney, Dana Andrews, Clifton Webb, they all come back in and they kind of do an audio condensed version of this for the radio, which is another thing you would never see in this time. Wow, that sounds great. Yeah, lovely. Otto Preminger, Brian... I think this is an impressive directorial piece. What about you? Like, tell us about your thoughts on Otto Preminger. Uh, I actually had a copy of Anatomy of a Murder. I really enjoy his filming style. There were pieces to this movie that once we get into superlatives, I'll go into a little bit more, that I probably would have preferred to be seen differently. But I do enjoy his overall tenor and style, what he adds in a movie, the feel, the vibe that he really goes for is something that, that really helped increase the demand from the audiences for noir film. So definitely think he's a, he's an architect, if you will, of what we've come to uh, come to expect from noir movies and uh, definitely a, a key piece of the puzzle and what I like so much about the genre. It's interesting how Otto Preminger got in the driver's seat in this one. He was reestablished through a relationship with 20th Century Fox. He had convinced studio production chief Daryl Zanuck to produce the rights to the novel. Preminger and Zanuck had not spoken since 1937. They were on the outs. And Preminger was replaced as the director of Kidnapped in 1938. And there was a bitter feud between them. So again, it's an interesting situation where the studios had all this power. Zanuck said, you're not going to direct again while I'm here. Well, Zanuck had to go into the military service. Again, World War II, it's a, it's a, it's a wild and crazy world that we're just so not familiar with in this time. And while he's away, uh, there's a 
Zanuck was the way he was allowed to direct Margin of Error in 1943. He was told he could produce Laura at, at Fox, but he was not going to be allowed to direct. And interestingly enough, the director who was on that uh, was then ousted by Otto Prevenger. And so he caught into the driver's seat. So Nathan, any thoughts that you had on the, on the director? Like I said, this isn't, an extremely flashy movie but there are several moments where it's there are these voiceovers especially by Lidecker sometimes it's Lidecker's internal monologues and sometimes it seems to be a radio recording of Lidecker but it's really interesting the choice to insert some things that on the second rewatch through you really start noticing that at the very beginning the movie basically tells you Lidecker murdered Laura because very early on the detective McPherson has this line like hey incidentally you wrote this article about a different murder where you said that the person was shot in the face with a double-barreled shotgun but that person was actually killed by a heavy weight interestingly it describes the murder of Laura pretty accurately though how did you know that and you get these really interesting clues throughout the movie this way that it's like you know i appreciate that the structure was totally there that you could figure out you could figure it out if you were really paying close attention um so i i appreciate that about this movie murder is my favorite crime (laughs) (laughs) by far yes quite Hmm. so it was interesting that uh Rubelin Mamelin was set to be the director and Preminger was only the producer and he had reactions to the early shooting. He said it was a simple dressing down for Judith Anderson and influenced perhaps by the association and the media role for which she was famous for had dressed in something flowing in, in Grecian and it was totally wrong for the contemporary style. He didn't like the sets. The performances were all appalling. He thought uh, Judith Anderson was overacting. Dana Andrews and Gene Tierney were amateurs, he called them, and something was wrong with Clifton Webb's performance as well. Preminger was handing out all kinds of criticisms as the producer, and he rushed an airmail to 20th Century Fox, the head of studio, Zanuck, in New York City, so that he could see for himself what was happening to Laura, and Zanuck agreed that it was a mess, and Rumelin uh, Mamelin was taken off to shoot everything over again, and Preminger got reinstated and was became the director of this. So it's kind of interesting. He was blackballed from being able to direct anything. So in probably helping to put this director in place, then sabotages him only to take his job. But Vincent Price said that Preminger was absolutely the guy who elevated this piece to what it was. And he said, it's on its own. It's pretty good. But it's through Preminger that we truly understand the characters of Laura and the all of this comes together so much under his watch and he was the one who really elevated this so much yeah it's a clean well-constructed movie it feels very put together and you know maybe that to some extent comes from them having had some previous material to test from where they said okay well they've had a go at this this works this doesn't and take something and move forward because it feels extremely put together yeah he completely reshaped the movie. He threw out two weeks worth of work. He reshaped all the sets. He he told the actors how to do things differently. He was a harsh taskmaster too. Gene Tierney was saying that she was he was on the set before the sun came up and he left air eight or night at night. He was simply tireless and very, very present and he would go until he would drop of exhaustion. So it was interesting that he would go through grueling conditions and Otto Preminger put everybody else through it too. Ten weeks and uh, it was exhausting for every one of them approaching every day at uh, morning to night. And uh, people were taking sleeping pills and amphetamines to keep up and running and stuff like that. So, Oh, I bet they were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the cast all got along famously, and the, but they respected Preminger's judgment. But boy, he uh, he's a tough guy to work under. Again, Price said Otto held us together, and he was the one who pushed it to what it, the greatness that it became. And Clifton and Webb also agreed. Maybe that's why Vincent Price keeps coming across in this movie as someone who doesn't care about all that much. He was too sleepy to concentrate. (laughs) But it works. Cocaine just didn't work on him. Yeah. Now, this this movie is uh, an Oscar winner for its cinematography, black and white cinematography. Brian, did you think this was a pretty movie? Yes, in a way. Um, For the period it was in, 
it was a very visually I'm going to say broad movie. I, I, I don't think you would necessarily be able to accomplish what this movie accomplishes today with the same gravitas. So I, I'm going to kind of contradict myself a little bit better, but or a little bit later, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it, the way it is filmed is striking. Uh, I just have more of a bone to pick with what they're filming. Okay. Ruining, yeah, the, the, yeah, that'll come clear later, I'm sure. So, I noticed this movie loves their transition shots. Nathan was right; they don't do a lot in terms of the sets, but they really take ambitious shots as they transition scenes. Like when they go into a building, they show the outside or people walking into a building, and it's an interesting transition that they do. Uh, it, it it is a separation of scenes, if you will, and. Um, these are these tend to be ambitious, like when they're going into Laura's apartment, like they shoot up high and they come in, zoom low and and they pan and they do a lot of these nice tricks and these transitions in these scenes where they're not in these sets as much. So I thought that was an interesting just choice there. And I, I just thought this was a really pretty movie. The night shots, the high contrast or low key lighting at nighttime. I loved I mentioned as the detective falls asleep and wakes up. And uh, they sure make smoking look glamorous in this movie. When Shelby and, and Gene Tierney, or Vincent Price and Gene Tierney, are out on the balcony smoking, uh, you know they're, they're, they're shooting the background dark, and uh, you know the cigarette ad has placed themselves in product placement, and this one hard to uh, make, make these beautiful people look glamorous while smoking. That's some, another thing that's so of this era. <laughs> Did they ever explicitly say what they were smoking, though? No, they didn't do that, but they just made smoking look really great. <laughs> Hmm. As is tradition. Yeah, in keeping with the tradition. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on editing or anything like that, or lighting, or any any kind of stylistic presentations, Nathan? I will say that it is interesting throughout the scenes in Laura's apartment, the care of framing different important parts of the set. So the clock that Lidecker gave to Laura is framed in the background of a lot of shots and is used a lot as a sound device to, to mark things. And also the painting of Laura is in a lot of scenes very carefully composed around different characters, especially during the first half of the movie when it's essentially the ghost of Laura, theoretically, watching the conversations happen and um, describing how different characters are thinking about things relative to her. So... Yeah. So I, I, one thing I noticed was interesting. I picked up a DVD or Blu-ray of this and I got the option of an extended edition and I clicked it and it wasn't really very different. In fact, only one scene and they had cut two minutes of footage from the original movie when they released it. And that was when Waldo's describing of how he remade Laura's clothing, hairstyle and introduced her to people, made her a woman of prominence and mentored her. They felt like these were very excessive scenes, the wardrobe, and there was a frivolity to it that they felt would just rub people of World War II eras and soldiers overseas in the wrong way with decadent luxury. And so they cut it, and it was much, much later that they, when the Laserdisc version came out, that they put this back in there. And so it's one of the least extended extended editions I've ever seen. Out of curiosity, did you guys get this version, or did you get the uh, scene where she's... You know, like she gives her a new hairstyle and gives her the best dresses and all that stuff. I purchased this on uh, on Apple, so I, I don't know if it was an extended edition or not. I definitely saw the hairstyle and the dress and whatnot. I don't know if it was supposed to be longer than that. It definitely That's didn't it. feel like two minutes. So you got it. You, you got it then. Yeah. Uh, so you know that's. It's just interesting. Did you feel like that would uh, like rub people the wrong way, or is that just an interesting thought of like, huh? different world back then again more times well yeah i mean with rationing i can't imagine what that's like you know in a world war i hope never to uh, know what that's like so i wouldn't presume to know what ticks people off back then i'm sure they couldn't have force uh, foreseen exactly all the things that tick people off nowadays so uh yeah i mean it's just one of those things where you know if you say it so then it must be yeah yeah, it's interesting to hear that that is what the extended ed edition covers because maybe this is something to go more into later, but 
it seems like the thing that I would expect to appear more in an extended cut would be more of what's going on in McPherson's head and more scenes showing the infatuation that he is apparently developing where in the cut of the movie that we have and i guess that is the only cut really the most specific we get about that during the first half of the movie is just lidecker's own words about it and Mm -hmm. so we really only after lidecker has accused mcpherson of that do we even see a hint that he that his investigation is more than just run of the mill um but after he says that you realize oh my gosh a lot of time has been passing apparently he's been spending a lot of time in this apartment there's all this all these things but that's all something that the audience has to kind of think about and realize as backstory it's not presented up front yeah yeah i want it too and they say you shall not have it (laughs) So, uh, Nathan, you made a lot of really great points on some of the set design earlier, but I just want to mention that you are right. There are sets, and so much so is they went to build a replica of the hotel dining room on the studio lot where Laura first encounters Waldo, and it's quite grand, and it just goes to show you the degree of control that they kind of needed to be able to make movies back then. The lighting, the angles, and everything like that, the degree at which point you created a set because you needed that control and filming on location was much more difficult back then. So you were, you were a hundred percent right when you said these are sets so much so that, uh, you know, even the uh, crazy bathroom, you know, that looks like it's Hmm. in a mansion somewhere. That's a recreated set. Yeah. And it's interesting with that in mind to think about some of these shots where some parts of these sets are used only to set up, exactly one thing so for example during the flashback with laura there's an entire or the flashback at the restaurant the hotel restaurant with laura there is an initial part of that shot that tracks over from a table that laura's been sitting at with a bunch of other girls from her office who are all laughing about something and who knows maybe laura is just doing this because she's the one who lost the bet and has to go for the pen advertisement and so she gets up and walks over and the shot tracks over and that's the only ever, and that's the t- only time you ever see that part of the set so it's interesting you know you're coming up with these scenes in advance and saying we need to build this much we need to build this much and we need to do it just for this one scene because it's really important to set up that this person has friends and is you know some somebody that people really are attracted to yeah absolutely and Another thing that I just want to call it, the architect of me, uh, I had an issue with Laura's apartment. It seemed like it was an old lady's apartment. And yes, it is old ladies, obviously, from a time and old ladies were once young ladies. But Laura's apartment in 1944 doesn't feel progressive and modern and urban enough. She is, a, it's really cool that this movie made a female character so successful in a corporate world, which was extremely difficult to do in 1944, even if Waldo sets her up. And I think there's a degree of like, she's, she's dressed amazingly in this movie. She's very sophisticated. And I feel like there's a sense of decadence and frivolity and doily, like, like lacy lampshades and stuff like that and everything like that. I just felt like, wouldn't this, you know, very striking woman with all the confidence in the world, she's young and shouldn't her apartment be, you know, a little bit more modern than this? I mean, yes, America has not fully absorbed the modern movement at this point but it it was here to some degree and i just felt like this woman's apartment didn't speak to the everybody was enamored with this woman i felt like her living space undersold it this is a movie that's made by people who are definitely of a sort of classical mentality in a lot of ways though i think this is a movie where they reference things, they, they, they reference symphonic performances and uh, in a, a joke mm. that different, you know, different times I watched it, you know, it goes into detail about, oh, yeah, well, this concert was Brahms first and Beethoven's ninth. And then later you find out it was Sibelius instead. This is this is a socialite group of people who I think. I don't, it's not all that surprising that they didn't do this. And even as you say that, it's not like this was an entirely overly, or while this apartment is definitely decadent seeming, it was certainly 
full of different technologies, if you think about it. By her mm -hmm. bed is a radio that's in the wall that she turns on to listen to things. She has, you know, all, all of, you know, lots of modern luxuries. So even if they are not, you know, to our design taste, Russell, you and I. That's true. Uh, they, uh, they definitely had the technology that was there. And I don't really i don't know i didn't get that i didn't get that impression okay that's and that's fair and in fairness she's absorbing a lot of like historic artifacts from waldo and like yes you know as well so waldo i think that is sensibility will rub off on her apartment because it's just, he's the one who set her up with it so i'm, I'm buying whether, whether she more. likes whether she likes it or not yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good point you, you actually not, make a good point now well now that you've said that i think i am 100 percent on that train i think waldo is just throwing lamp you know doily lampshades at her and she's like sure i guess i'll put this in my house i will give you a new hairstyle and a new furnished apartment and new <laughs> dresses all with the promise of your virtue <laughs> but uh i like going back this far because the styles and stuff are so different and it's a time warp brian did you like hats big suits and high-waisted pants yeah, yeah i was gonna say what do you think about the styles of the time uh hard pass all across the board <laughs> um i think you could pull off one of those detective hats i think you could do it uh, all right all right the hat maybe like just a, a loose maybe but everything else is a, is a solid no and i feel like every time we've we've touched on a couple different points that all make me want to go to my superlative so i it's just it, it, uh, i don't know there's there's something just so cluttered about that time period that I can't stand it. Okay. I'll tell you the one thing that got me the most was McPherson's tie clip looks so weird. Like when he takes oh, his jacket off. Oh, the little off. loopy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost got like a, a bubble loop or I don't even know. There's probably a name for whatever that style was. But yeah, I noticed that too. And I was like, you've got like a thing going on with your tie. Yeah. And it's a large man with a tie that seems entirely too small for a large man. <laughs> But the uh, times change. Uh, Nathan, any any of those things catch your eye that's worth noting here? Yeah, like I said, the uh, the high pants, the the baggy baggy everything. Uh, they did certainly all clean up pretty well for their party dinner, but their everyday attire, not not something that I think we uh, as a society need to go back to. Okay, I thought Laura looked amazing throughout all of this movie until she put these strange floppy hats on. Like, they just looked like someone took, like, a funnel cake and, like, draped it on her head. Or, sorry, a flapjack and just dropped it on her head. And, like, at one point, even uh, Shelby's like, that's a wonderful hat. It's almost as nice as the woman in it. And I'm just like, wow, let's not compliment the hat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've always liked the, uh, the um, what, what would you call it? Almost like a Gatsby yeah. style hat. I, I actually kind of like the, the close-cropped... Like woman with short hair, close crop, Bonnie and Clyde style hat. But this this one had that like the drooping, like it went all the way down to like under her ears. I'm not saying that that hat specifically. No, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying that during the time period, I think that there were these kind of almost like a cone that a woman puts on their head, but it was close cropped and usually had some sort of hair flare either out the front or sides that I can, I can kind of get behind it. Okay. Brian, does this movie feel like a noir when you look at it? Because actually, some of the, I talk about the night shots feeling noirish and high contrast, but this movie doesn't actually go and do extreme low key lighting. It was so stylistic of these '40s uh, uh, noir films. Were you okay with that? Because it's maybe a little different. It's not necessarily as crimey, more of a, a character piece. Or did you want all those stylistic dark shadows over people's faces? a la like what we saw in Asphalt Jungle or Maltese Falcon. I do prefer that, I will say. It didn't really bother me. I think it would be more prominent in a movie that was in color than it is in one in black and white. It didn't offend me in a way where I'm, and I use offend like, okay, I have a problem with this. <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't something that I was like, oh, I can't believe they did this in daylight. Like, it wasn't <laughs> something that really upset me in any way. That's fair. It wasn't what I was thinking when you think noir. Now, having said that, sure, everything else played through so well. And I did think a lot of the cinematography with its panning, its movement, and its use of those sets was still very impressive. So it still had the wit, the witty banter, um, 
you know, the back and forths between characters that is, you know, so prominent in noir. Lighting isn't something that I typically would get really been out of shape for unless they did like an entire Batman movie in the daytime. It just, you know, one of those things that this didn't, this didn't strike any chord of, of, uh, so off kilter that, that I'd make note of it. That's fair. Now, Nathan, you are going to put us all to shame on this one, but you said you're familiar with the soundtracks of the era. What do you feel about the movie music by David Raskin in this movie? You know, I am somewhat familiar with the soundtracks of the era. I will say that I'm surprised to hear that this one is ranked so highly. It's to me a little bit one note. It's a specific sort of what I think of as hotel ballroom that is trying to sound 1920s or 30s ish. And that's about it. It's got that one theme that moves through and it's, yeah, it's a nice theme, but doesn't do a lot else with that. And that's it. I'm, I'm going to be pretty critical of it. I'm not impressed. So that's interesting. So I said, Laura was number seven on the AFI's best soundtracks. The, the scores above it are, Six, Jaws, five, The Godfather, four, Psycho, three, Lawrence of Arabia, two, Gone with the Wind, and number one is Star Wars. So you don't feel like this necessarily deserves to be in that class, then is what I'm detecting from you. Absolutely not. I think that this is something that people voting on that list probably had a lot of nostalgia for, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to say that I think that this merits a lot. It's, there's not a lot of music in this movie. And when it comes in, I, pre- I always appreciate when music is used in a diegetic way where the main theme of this movie is also Laura's actual favorite song in the movie. I, I do think that that's fun, but it's never explored. It's never developed. It's just stated as is, and then it goes away, and then you have characters doing things. Um, I, I don't know. This, this, isn't my, this isn't a soundtrack that jumps out to me. Okay. Unlike the long goodbye. So one thing I will say on this is I did read that it was considered quite a snub that this didn't get a nod for soundtrack. And I'm with Nathan on this. I, you could have convinced me after my first watching of this movie that the movie had no music. Wow. Like if you had said like, Oh, did you notice? Like, like if you had stated to me, Hey, did you realize there wasn't any music in that movie? I would have been like, uh, really? Like, (laughs) like you could have made the case and I would have been like, are you sure? Oh, this is all surprising. Yeah, um, I liked it. I, no, there, there was no, there's nothing memorable about the music to this movie. Wow, I, I did like it, and uh, it, you're right, it was snubbed in the Oscar nominations. David Raskin's music, though, was so popular that the studio soon found itself full of letters asking what, where the recording was available and where they could buy it. And sheet music to play it was flew off the shelves, and instrumental music was released to be a huge hit for the public. So it grew just by people seeing the movie and then resonating with the song. And it's one of those things where, you know, you, when you go out to eat or whatever, you ask somebody, can you play that? So it is interesting. This More than remembering whether this movie exists or not, this, this is, seems to be one of those generational things that we're seeing here. Uh, it, the music's not connecting as much with, with at least us who's watching it here. But uh, I liked it. I was a little surprised to see it at number seven, though, to Nathan's point. Yeah, it sounds like based on what you're describing that this one song was something that, you know, it works really well on its own. And like I say, you know, it makes sense that it's as something in the movie that it's Laura's favorite song and you just hear a snippet of it and it makes a lot of, it feels right. But as a soundtrack, it doesn't really leave much of an impression to me. Now, are you guys ready to hand out some awards? I've been waiting all show. <laughs> you say have been... what I've got to say. Brian's like sitting on his hands, like like Sue the Surprise Woman, like Kristen Wiig from like Saturday Night Live. Like, I got it, I got it, I got it, I can't hold it in. I must be heard. I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer because Nathan's going to go first. <laughs> MVP Nathan. That's fine. Lidecker. Oh my gosh. The performance of the Lidecker character is just so over the top in a way. And yet... Clifton Webb manages to come off as sufficiently posh and snobbish that you can almost believe this is someone who acts this way almost to provoke a response from people so that he can write bad articles about them. Yeah, I love him. He's That's a great choice. Oscar nominated for good reason. Brian, what about you? MVP? 
Uh, I went with Gene Tierney on this one as Laura. I, I kind of said my rationale earlier in the film where she literally had the character built up for her and then she had to come in and produce said character based on what other people had built her up to be. And that's very rare in film. And, and I'd say even rarer where someone's able to do it so successfully. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great choice as well. And I'm going to just take a different stroke here. I'm going to go with Otto Preminger. This movie could have been an okay movie, but it was through his, his attention to detail, his perfectionist nature. If they just let this movie be made with the original director, there's no way we'd be talking about it today. And there's no way it would have a 100% fresh score on Rotten Tomatoes. I think for sure, Otto Preminger is the difference in what made this movie so stylish, so well constructed, and got every bit of the best that he could from all of his actors. So good job, Otto Preminger. Plus, I think your name's awesome. Yeah, you just picked a German during World War II. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Uh, Nathan, best supporting actor. I'm going to come up with Carpenter here as as played by Vincent Price. I think that his performance is kind of hilarious to watch in a lot of scenes as he's bouncing off ca- other characters. On his own, he seems kind of like he doesn't have a lot of drive to do any one thing in particular except maybe eventually protect Laura at the end but there are so many great little moments where it's between him and Ed Treadwell or him and Lidecker or him and just trying to get in on this investigation with McPherson that he's just really fun to watch go through things yeah that's a very good point and there are no wrong answers on this one it's a small cast and they're all awesome Brian who's your best supporting uh, I went with Clifton Lidecker here. Clifton Whip? Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, <just> put, <laughs> I, I split the character name and his actual name. Um, yes, I he's uh, he's I I feel like I've known people kind of like him and it's they're amusing to witness. Like it, it's kind of like having an issue with something super awkward on TV versus like eating it up in real life. When you see people who are actually this arrogant, it's 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 amusing. Yeah, it is. I'm also going to go with Clifton Webb here. He's going to get awards from all of us on this one. But yeah, Waldo Lidecker is an amazing character, and I couldn't get enough of him. You never knew what he was going to say. His confidence and his, uh, you know, arrogance. and But he is also smart. Like, it's not completely unfounded. He's not an, he's not an arrogant idiot. So he, he does back it up with some degree of wit. But uh, he's vicious. I, I He makes him such an interesting character. He can't let He's so jealous, he just can't let anybody uh, get there. And he's so used to getting his way on everything. He he c- tries to control things you just can't control. And uh, it's so interesting. Uh, you guys have made other good points as well. So what a good character. Hidden gem, Nathan. And Treadwell. I feel like she shows up fairly infrequently in the movie, but she just has a bunch of hilarious scenes. This is Anne Treadwell as being played by Judith Anderson. Mm -hmm. And you just get this great sense of someone who is a little bit desperate, kind of conniving, and who is actually really earnest in certain ways. And there's just some great scenes where she's making eyes with with, with Shelby Carpenter about... uh, how annoyed she is that Shelby is with Shelby is with Laura or her just absolutely hilarious conversation in the kitchen with him at one point, which is just a great scene. Yeah. She's, she's fantastic. I, I, yeah. Great choice. Brian, how are you? Uh, I went with Dorothy Adams, uh, the maid. I, I just appreciated, you know, someone coming in and, and going to bat for Laura. It just, it seemed like a nice thing when when your when your house person really likes you. I was brought up to spit at cops. Yeah, go ahead, spit if you want to. Yeah, she was fiery. As she went back out to her car, turned on her ice cube, and drove off. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then dumped a uh, a whole pitcher of sugar in his gas tank, and then crammed a potato in his tailpipe, and then like, uh, <laughs> and then egg, 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 egged his car windshield and say, "Suck on that, coppers." <laughs> middle finger out the window as she drives off there is literally a sort of family heritage story in my family about someone who due to a mix-up in letters being written by 
in in ways that made it sound like one person was dead and then it was actually somebody else and that person showed up at a relative's doorstep and the relative literally died of a heart attack oh man and i saw the hmm. scene with bessie sees laura first for the first time and i'm like oh dear this is actually <laughs> unhealthy obviously not within the last century kind of story but you know this time period this kind of character maybe yeah it nearly kills lidecker too so my hidden gem and I'm, I'm i like to i like to go deep sometimes especially when the cast is so small i had to i had to really look for somebody but i'm gonna go with the gawking boy who cannot believe it's waldo lidecker standing there in his office so uh <laughs> <laughs> like uh he he dumps it on so heavy the first time i watched it i didn't think too much of it but the next time it's just like I mean, is like I, we all get that Waldo's like a man who's a recognizable name because he has a column. But I, I was kind of sitting there thinking it was just like, man, it's like Elvis Presley just walked in the building or something to this guy. Like he's like he's like six inches away from his face. He's like, young man, if you get any closer to me, and he's like, I'm going to crack your skull. But I was like, if you get any closer to me, your mouth is going to be touching mine, and I don't want that. <laughs> he also looks exactly like a lot of cartoons from that day his hairstyle his sort of round face the way he's dressed it's it's kind of funny yeah definitely he looks like a ventriloquist doll yeah yeah <laughs> um recast nathan if you had to recast somebody and put somebody else in their place who would it be well for me it's not a character who's in the movie it's actually some music because whatever imbecile changed a concert program at the last minute from brahms first symphony and <laughs> beethoven's ninth symphony on the same concert which is an insane utterly crazy concert program to have just like full stop those are two of the biggest most awesome symphonies ever written and like if you're going to change out beethoven's nine you have to figure out something to do with the chorus and they put it to sibelius as a replacement like that's grounds for having a riot. You got to go to something bigger than those two. Like you can't, you you can't change, you can't swap that out in a concert program. So, you got to go to something like, oh, we're going to change Beethoven Nine to Mahler Symphony Number no. Eight or something. The Symphony of a Thousand with like humongous chorus and double orchestra and stuff, stuff like that. So like, man, I can totally get with carpenter about having fallen asleep at that concert because if i went in expecting brahms symphony with one of the greatest french horn solos of all time and beethoven symphony with epic chorus and also one of the greatest french horn parts of all time and i ended up with sibelius man if i was expecting those pieces on a concert yeah i'm gonna fall asleep too wow okay uh i mean yeah I, sons of bitches i thought i thought i was thinking all of that just now that's what i was thinking <laughs> <laughs> brian recast somebody and put somebody else in their place and uh, if it's too hard sometimes these older eras can be quite a challenge if you need to go with it like if you made it today you I'm, i'll let you off the hook with that i can i can i say yeah the symphony thing yeah <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> I have strong opinions about this, and especially the second time around watching this movie, I was like, oh my gosh. And actually, I'm going to take us on a second tangent here, because my brain at first thought it was too crazy to say Brahms first and Beethoven's ninth on the same concert, because that's just ridiculous. You would never put those two symphonies together. It it would it would be just blowing every, you know, you, you got to do those as two separate concerts. Wow. Okay. Fair enough. So my recast is going to be Dana Andrews, Detective McPherson. I know this is a big this is a big move, but this is a small cast and everybody's so good. I actually am going to put Frank Sinatra as an actor in here and I know you're thinking music, but he's awesome in The Manchurian Candidate and uh I I'm not even bringing him in for like the guys and dolls like here I am to sing and stuff like that side of things. I'm just bringing him in because I think he's actually a really good actor, and I think he'd be a really good Detective McPherson in this. And I'm basing that largely on how much I love the Manchurian Candidate. So, get me old blue eyes. Yeah, and you know I wouldn't mind having that dinner song back with McPherson somehow if that was the case. Yeah, I was gonna say you might need to find a music number then if that's true. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, Nathan. 
What is your best shot of the movie? I alluded to this earlier, but it's the scene where Lidecker has confronted McPherson about him being in love with Laura and in love with the portrait, which he's apparently put in a bid on. And the whole scene is composed with the three characters in the scene, McPherson, Lidecker, and the portrait. And the portrait is always sort of just behind McPherson's head and looking down on him in a way. And it's like, oh man, this is this is well put together. Like I, I I've said that I feel like we need a little bit more build up other than just Lidecker accusing McPherson of being in love with this. But if you're gonna do it in one scene, this is this is how you have to shoot it. It's haunting in that moment, I, th- I agree. Good use of the painting and low, low, low camera angle too there. Brian, a shot. I actually like the uh, trailing the car in the rain. This will become more uh, understandable once we get to uh, change one thing. But Ooh, another yeah. tease. He's into the superlatives. Yeah. He teased the superlatives all episode long. And now he's teasing us for later superlatives in the superlatives. I, I, dude, I, I'm still cr- I'm, ch- I'm still crawling toward what I really want to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh man the suspense of this movie and now the, now the suspense of brian talking about this movie this is this is podcasting at its finest i can't wait um <laughs> tension's killing me my best shot's going to be actually the opening scene of waldo's home it's a beautiful shot it pans uh from the opening you see the china case and through that china case then you see the clock the they go to open louver doors across the terrace and it keeps panning and then you see waldo's study you keep seeing all these facets of who this character is before you ever meet him you can tell that he's a man of these collections and that he's a man of status and the world that you're being put into as you pointed out nathan like it's setting the tone right away and you're getting all of this in like five seconds and the detective smiles and uh, he looks back to the clock and then it transitions nicely to McPherson being called into the bathroom by Waldo and it splits and it has a great entrance and there's a lot of great camera work, which I'm kind of counting as separate shots on this one, but it's followed up by the introduction of Waldo and his amazing bathtub. And uh, this movie is pulling out all the stops early on for great camera work. And there's a lot of really good camera work. I totally see why it won the Oscar for this. Um, but it, right off the bat, great stuff here. And um, and nobody mentioned the interrogation scene where Laura is brought in to be questioned by Mc, Detective McPherson. The light that he shines on her face, and that's an intense moment between the two characters. That's some great camera work too. Yeah, absolutely. There there are a lot of of great scenes in this movie, uh and, and and great shots, so definitely definitely a long list to pull from there. Yeah. Now best scene, Nathan. My favorite scene in this movie is actually one of the lighter moments in this movie, even as a noir. This has a fair amount of humor in it and I think my favorite exchange is in the Treadwell's kitchen at the party when Carpenter and Anne Treadwell and Laura are all having a conversation and they're joking about how Adam Treadwell won't who's 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 this older woman won't marry the younger man Shelby Carpenter and yet you know the subtext being of which ultimately she would actually kind of like to be in some kind of relationship with him and he really doesn't actually want to be in a relationship with her but he he really values having her money as a support and then they're joking with laura having good sense it's and the acting together is just really effective you really get a sense that these are all friends together you you i can tell you like vincent price in this movie he had a scene where he was going to be singing a song at the party they cut it in the end which is such an old movie thing to do like to just have a song in the middle of it your enjoyment of vincent price and your in your desire for more parts of the soundtrack i'm wondering did you want to see Vincent Price sing at that same party? Why did you tell me that, Russell? Now I want to put that in my change one thing. <laughs> Even though my change one thing is actually uh, a lot funnier. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so so yeah, more Vincent Price. Yeah, yeah, Vincent Price is checking all the boxes there for Nathan. Now, Brian, what about you? What's your best scene? The appar- What I thought was the apparition scene, it's him waking up from his... his frustration stupor to finding you know, she's still alive and and th- their interaction with one another once that's figured out and the questioning i, I felt like that was a a, a kick start uh to a slower point in the movie okay that's a good choice 
and this is another one of these great scenes where nobody's talked about it, but it's my favorite scene. It's when Detective McPherson has Waldo bring everybody together for a party for Laura's coming alive again party. Uh, or, or I guess a resurrection party. I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's a thing, um, but uh, uh, it's a Laura's not dead party. But uh, the detective gets a call and he goes up and rather prominently says, "Yeah, I'm about to make the arrest." And my gosh, like the power play that he's making here, the tension that he's going up as he builds up to his accusation is pretty suspenseful. Because I gotta say, at this point, to Nathan's point earlier. They've made them all have a pretty realistic, viable reason why any of them could have done it. I was pretty out on Bessie, but I definitely was intrigued at what he was going to do. And it was kind of a it was kind of a false alarm. It was it was just another turn for him to get more information. And uh, I liked that it didn't like this is where the normal who done it movie who does it. They already had the big reveal that Laura was alive and there was more stuff to come after this. So in a way, like it made you think that this was the big climax. But this movie is so much more than that. Like, it's just another good turn. And that's why it's my favorite scene, because it it is just it, it downplays that. And all these other wonderful things can stand up because of that. So that is such a fantastic scene as he stares at each of the, each of them in turn and gets a good a good look at them and finally takes Laura out. And I feel like a lesser movie and a lesser story makes mcpherson turn around and explain how he did everything and it would be almost cartoonish at that point but no this is a movie where he's just this earnest cop who is maybe a little theatrical in this moment but he really does just want to get laura away from these people so that he can talk to her separately and really get a good fix definitely now best wardrobe makeup moment nathan my favorite moment of wardrobe in this movie is McPherson's magic trick that he kind of pulls as he he's sitting in this chair having fallen asleep under the porch of Laura and she walks in and he's he's got his tie undone he's got his jacket off he's you know and then throughout the scene he just slowly puts everything back on until he's buttoning his jacket up and ready to sort of walk out of there at the end and it's really interesting how he kind of pulls himself back together in that moment like oh there's hope i can i i can move forward with my life now she's alive yeah that's a good point like his wardrobe is like assembling and that's reflective of him yeah i like that uh it, it's funny i just I, I had a completely different take with uh Lidecker, you know putting himself together there uh yeah, literally all the pieces of his wardrobe I, as you were talking about it i was literally picturing or, or hearing the sequence in Austin Powers where he just keeps peeing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, just keeps and, going. and like he, because at one point I remember thinking, I was like, and now a pocket handkerchief and a flout. Come on, man. Like <laughs> he just kept adding things. And, it, and for some reason, <laughs> as we were talking about it just now, I'm picturing that, that peeing scene from Austin Powers where it's like drip, drip, drip. P. He's like, ah, just be done. Oh my god. The line he spelt off at the end of that's amazing too. Uh, he was like, uh, did she make you a more empathetic, caring person? He's like, well, let me say this: if my neighbor's children were devoured by wolves, I would be truly sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, Waldo's a quote machine, which we won't steal that just yet. He, he, is. he is. He is. Oh my gosh. He is. Brian, best wardrobe. Oh, that's that's that that is now my piece. The 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 comparing him getting dressed to Austin Powers peeing is it? That's, okay, that's that's gonna be. My, I'm gonna stand by that one just because. As soon as that light bulb, that connection went off, I was like, "Yep, that's, yeah, that's." Uh, I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> it's got to be Laura for me. It was just hard to find the one thing. She has a dozen different amazing hairstyles. She wears so many fashionable dresses and whatnot through this one. She really is stunning. And in a way, like like in the movie Something About Mary, like where everybody's just pining over Mary, everybody's falling over themselves over this one. And she does deliver. She's beautiful in this one. And I, I got to say, the scene that probably it shows the most is when she's being interrogated. The sash that she has in, like, she's just completely pure elegance in this one. Maybe a runner-up to the formal white dress that she had at the party. But, uh, yep. Gene Tierney, change one thing, Nathan. So this is going to be something that would show up if this movie were remade today. Throughout this movie, 
McPherson has this one weird thing that he does where every now and then some tension is happening in the scene and his way of taking it apart is to pull out this <laughs> little baseball game where he has to roll a couple of little tiny metal balls into takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of skill, takes a lot of control, as he says. And Blydecker says, it annoys me. And, uh, and, and, and McPherson <laughs> just goes, I know. It's almost as if he uses this game as a way of like, oh, 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 oh. Carpenter and Lidecker are about to come to blows. I'd better distract them by doing something completely off the wall. So, you know, it, I mentioned in my recap of this movie that it really feels like something that it's like the modern equivalent of someone pulling out a cell phone in the middle of an important meeting and starting to play some game or something. Bejeweled so, all of a sudden, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Angry birds. So, so my... In a modern retelling, a cop randomly pulls out his phone and starts playing Flappy Bird in the middle of an interrogation scene. That is what this would be. That's my change one thing if there if this were being remade. We don't get behind the scenes DVD extras at this point, but now that you've said this, Nathan, I'm envisioning uh, you know, like all the things Otto Priminger tried to do. Like, it's like, I want you to have this ball in a cup. A ball in a cup? Yeah, just try it out. No, that's not working. What about the like? What about like? like what about the like the stick with like two balls where you like pull it up and down, up and down, and it clicks up against each other? No, that's not doing it. And what what about a yo-yo? Like, uh, you could have those like horseshoe and chain toys that are like woven together somehow, but if you manipulate them in just the right way, they come apart. There's all these old toys that you have the option to do with this, I and know. he's just got this little box in his pocket, and it's so forward thinking. It's just like a kid today. <laughs> they even talked to like the wardrobe department see we tried to have him have a chinese finger trap at first but it just was too distracting what he was doing with his hands so we had to change that no it's the little the little baseball game with little bbs inside of it got more attention on this podcast than i ever thought possible and it's brought such joy to me so thank you for bringing that up <laughs> um brian this is the big moment if you could change one thing what would it be i i really wanted stuff to happen outside of their homes like or like I, this movie felt so claustrophobic to me i felt like the the having so much emphasis on bedrooms on living rooms on a dining room like them going outside and smoking a cigarette was almost fresh air to me <laughs> <laughs> yep and it you was, kind of it, wanted I mean, to be out in the cold with lidecker when he goes to spy on laura they tease you too between every scene because they like these outside transition shots. So like when they were going into Laura's summer home, they show like the car outside and walking in the front door and I can just see Brian constantly getting disappointed. It's like, oh, oh, is it outside? Maybe they're going to talk on the front doorstep. No, they're inside again. As soon as they got out to that scene where he's following him in the rain, it was like Andy Dufresne coming out of the, the poop <laughs> pipe in Shawshank Redemption and being like, I'm out. I'm free. Like... <laughs> it was ah, it was such a claustrophobic movie and all of their homes were so cluttered and it it just drove me nuts. See, wouldn't it have been so nice much. had Laura had like a nice sophisticated modern home? Well, and, and 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 when he comes over and he's like, "I want to take my stuff back. Please give him the stuff. The stuff needs to go. All of the stuff needs to go. All of this crap Here you your gave her." Like <laughs> Oh my God. Like, like, please take all of the things. She has far too many things. That is another, these are, this is probably one of the funniest rounds of change one things that I've ever had. Mine is, <laughs> mine's not as funny as either of yours too. Mine is uh, simply, and I think Nathan alluded to this earlier, give Judith Anderson more time on the screen. Ann Treadwell is a great character. She's perceptive. She's conniving. She's, she's an odd bird in her own right, but she's, she's quite interesting I would say she's as interesting as Shelby or maybe even as much as Waldo. And she just doesn't get as much screen time, but give her, find, find a few minutes, carve out some moments here and there. But Judith Anderson was awesome in this. And I didn't even give her any superlatives. It just goes to show you the strength of the cast, but get her in this movie more. She's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. The few scenes that she does have in another example of this in this movie, she alludes to some things at one point when she's talking with Laura about, who suspects who on things and then she explains why she wants carpenter and it's 
really fascinating and the way she describes it is so interesting and they have such great chemistry yeah get get us more of Anne treadwell she's awesome yeah and you're right that that, that scene was one of the things that i almost picked that for my best scene but then i like i this scene this movie's so good then i got like five other scenes and it's just like uh it's it's this is a, this is a tall order but uh no you're right she's awesome so I'm glad I got her in with a superlative somewhere, but uh, this is going to be hard. And I think this could be a Waldo Lidecker, uh a thon. Yeah, this could be. Uh, yeah, it's going to be sweet. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Nathan, what is your best quote of this movie? There are so many great quotes from Lidecker, but the one that got me early on was when Lidecker is making his apologies to Laura at her office and she is really accusing him of having been so brusque and rude to her. And he just says, ordinarily, I'm not without a heart. Really? Shall I produce x-rays to prove it? (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah. Brian, what about you? What's your best quote? How singularly innocent I look this morning. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Uh, I love it when Lidecker says, I'm not kind. I'm vicious. It's the secret of my charm. (laughs) <laughs> he has so many good lines every he does everything it's oh it's, my gosh it's it's very it's very rich and and one one-liners i kind of thought somebody might pick out where he said uh, you'd better watch out mcpherson you'll finish up in the psychiatric ward i doubt they've ever had a patient who fell in love with a corpse that was a good one yeah or another another great one was early on when uh Lidecker's in his bath and 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 he like pulls a piece of paper and reads his prepared response to McPherson off of it and McPherson's like why are you, why are you doing this and Lidecker just says I am the most misquoted man in America. <laughs> no, yeah, that was mm-hmm. good. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know nobody mentioned this one, but I also love this one when he says uh, when the McPherson's like you know you're on my list of suspects too, right? And he goes good. It would be an insult to be overlooked. <laughs> right he's awesome let's come full circle here we are on a scale of one to five stars nathan with half star intervals what would you rate laura from 1944 you know this is a four and a half for me i really like this movie it's very simply constructed it is pretty direct but the acting is just absolutely spectacular. The chemistry between all the characters is great. You believe that they are really feeling all of these different, all have specific reasons for doing everything that they're doing. And you can read that on their faces the whole time. It's great. Uh, I really enjoyed this movie. Absolutely. Great, great, uh, great rating. Now, Brian, what about you? Do you like it as much as Nathan? I- Yeah, I gave it a solid four star rating. Uh, This was a really enjoyable movie outside of my one uh, world in a box uh, uh, vibe toward it. But uh, as far as the the story went, it was phenomenal. Yes. And and my rating, I'm going to break out the five star rating on this one. This has been one of those ones that I've really enjoyed. It holds up really well. I like returning to it. And I'm with the 100% fresh rating on this one. I, I loved it. And it's incredibly clever. And I would love to see more movies reach this level of complexity and the level of acting and the level of direction in this. It's It does everything so, so well. And it's in a charming era of a genre that we don't get to appreciate quite as often as I'd like to today. So five for me, which I'm more generous with than anybody else on the round table probably, but so be it. Well, I mean, listen, it's your dealer's choice. I mean roll roll with something that you love that's true that's true nathan do you want to help me pick a movie for next time let's do it russell okay nathan do you want to help me pick a movie for next time i do russell let's get it so we're gonna do some movies with some prominent female-led roles here so uh the first movie is to die for is it really Yes, it is To Die For from 1995. A beautiful but naive aspiring television personality films a documentary on teenagers with a darker ulterior motive. Option number two, Margaret from 2011. A young woman witnesses a bus accident and is caught up in the aftermath where the question of whether or not it was intentional affects many people's lives. And option number three, Safe. An affluent, unexceptional homemaker is in the suburbs develops multiple chemistry sensitivity well you know russell 
You never told me its name, but if, as you say, this movie is to die for, I think we're going to have to watch it. All right. It's a Nicole Kidman uh, star-led film with Matt Dillon in it as well and Joaquin Phoenix, Casey Affleck, and others. So definitely tune in next time. We'll have a special guest for a crossover episode on that one. So it will be to die for. All right. Brian, thank you so much for joining me. I had fun, man. Thank you, Russ. All right. Nathan, thanks, you. thanks, man. Been fun as always. And thank you, all lords, ladies, and nice for the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. So subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you get us. We want to hear from you. Those ratings really help us others find the show, and that's the best thing you can do to help the show. Give us a like on Facebook. Engage with us. We want to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter at, at movie underscore retro and email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com if you want to go into more detail or if you even want to be on the show. Producing and providing this podcast is fun but not free, so we invite you to support us at our Patreon page at www.patreon forward slash Retro Movie Roundtable. And as always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Brian? For a man in his condition, he had a lot of energy. Stubborn old crackpot, I could have sworn he was dead. <laughs>